right, so I'm going to get started. I uh, have a lot of, lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, it's an honor to come here and I'm really excited to talk about the connectivity features of HTML5. Uh, my name is Peter Lubbers. This is my license plate. Um, that pretty much sums up what I do. I work for Kazing, a small Mountain View based startup. I uh, work on WebSocket platform and also on HTML5 training. And besides that, I uh, started two years ago the San Francisco HTML5 user group. How many of you are part of the San Francisco HTML5 user group? Okay. Well, it's free to join. I'll show you how to do that later. Um, apart from that, as Carl pointed out, I, I wrote a book that's now in the second edition. And I'm here with, uh, we have a small booth at the exhibitor hall there. And you can come and, and check that out if you have any further questions. I have to sort of trim it down to 25 minutes. So if you have any further questions, if you want to see the code behind some of the, the stuff we're talking about, uh, please come and, and check it out. Um, we'll be here all day and tomorrow. So somebody once asked me to, like, like who licenses HTML5? And that sort of gave me that idea to get the, uh, the license plate. And I was glad I picked that up in time. Uh, Shortly after, somebody else from locally here uh, actually picked up the HTML 5.0 one. So it's been kind of a race to get the, the latest. Uh, if you are in Texas, everything is bigger there. <laughs> That's, uh, thought you would get a kick out of that. All right, so I want to talk about the connectivity features of HTML 5. So in this conference, you'll see lots of presentations, things about uh, web applications, WebGL, uh, various other parts of HTML5. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the HTML5 connectivity. And I'm going to do that in the context of web applications. And to, to start with, I want to just go back a second and talk about, well, how did HTML5 come about in the first place? And it was actually in 2004, not far from here, there was a W3C meeting in which the, there was a, the topic was whether HTML should be augmented for web applications. And it was actually voted down, as you can see. A 14 to 8 vote against improving HTML for web applications. And so promptly, two days later, the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group was started. And they started working on a specification called Web Applications 1.0, which became HTML5. So you can see that a application development is, much, is very much the core of HTML5. It's making applications with features that up until now were only really in, in desktop uh, programming languages like, like Java and C++. All of those things you can now do in HTML5. Now, HTML5 can be broken up into different feature categ categories. There's these different areas and some of it is uh, you can debate uh, for quite a while whether it's pure part of HTML5 or not, we're not gonna get into that. But I'm talking a little bit about it in the, in the larger umbrella term of HTML5, including all of the things like WebGL and geolocation, what we typically refer to as the newt category or new and exciting web technologies. If you zoom in on that, you'll see that each of these areas has seen an explosion in growth. And I'm going to post these slides. Uh, the, they'll be posted on the, on the DEF CON 5. All of the presentations are going to be there. So you'll see this may be a little bit hard to see in the back. But each of these areas, if you look, for example, at local storage uh, or uh, caching and, and storage, there's you know, multiple APIs for local storage. There's uh, a new cache altogether. So all of that stuff has seen just an enormous growth. And with those features, you can really start building cool applications. Now, these features can be used today. And the first thing you want to do with that is uh, actually, of course, finish this, present, this conference, uh, all the sessions. But then after that, you can go back to work and really start building HTML5 applications. It's ready to be done today, right? You can first of all go to caniuse.com or uh, mobilehtml5.org to see where specific features are supported. And you'll see the modern browsers support over 75% of all these features already. But then there are also the ways to make those features work. So for almost every feature, there is a way to make it work 
in all their browsers if you need to support those. And that's pretty typical. And Modernizer is a tool that can help you with that and they have an incredible fallbacks page that has literally hundreds of fallbacks. So there's really no reason to say, well, HTML5 is not ready yet, we can't use it. And things that are as complex as WebSocket that we'll talk about later have been emulated in pure JavaScript so you can actually use it. So none of the features I'm going to talk about are, are far future. They're, they're really here today. <clears throat> Now, HTML5, one of the design goals is that it, what they say, paves the cow paths. That means it makes it easier to do things you're already trying to do. A uh, good example of it would be the rounded corner, the border radius property in CSS3, where before you had to use images to create rounded corners, and now you can simply say border radius 10 pixel, and now you've got it. You'd be basically say, saying, browser, you know how to do this, take care of that for me. And that's very similar, and, and I would say one of the biggest areas where cow paths had to be paved uh, was the connectivity area. Things like comma technologies and uh, figuring out how to get around the same origin policy in a browser, pretty hard. Um, if you look at the overall HTML5 connectivity features, you can see that there are a lot of things going on. And the entire connectivity and real-time area, by the way, is a pretty invisible thing. There's, there's nothing visual until you, for example, take the data that you get into the page and display it in a canvas, things like that. But you can see that inside a page, so the first, first myth about all of this is that we're going to be serving pages over a WebSocket. That's, that's not going to happen. We are, will continue to get web pages from an HTTP or perhaps a speedy server or some sort of caching edge network. But then within that page, we're using JavaScript to create other connections. These are possibly long-lived socket connections, uh, server sent events uh, connections or uh, XML HTTP requests. With level two, there's a new way to, to spread it across a much larger uh, backend. And cross-document messaging allows you to do intra-page communication to parts that are actually not on the same origin. So there's, it's really a very powerful set of tools that you have available, and that's what we're going to talk about. Now, you might say, well, what are you talking about? All of that stuff that you just showed me, I could already do. And I would agree with that, that it's possible, but this is one of those things where HTML5 makes it easier. It paves that cow path. It says, all right, it was very hard to create, let's say, a bidirectional what looks like a socket connection where you can send and receive at the same time. Sure, it's possible with techniques like Comet. Uh, you can kind of see that the name, you know, you need Comet to spell complexity. It, if you've worked with that stuff, it's really, uh, really hard to make it work. And now the, the APIs are ridiculously simple. It's a, it's a great way to, to move forward. And then with these fallback libraries I talked about that are on the modernizer page, you can actually make these things work and, and not worry too much about it. Code against the HTML5 APIs and not worry about um, you know, the, the back falling back. All right, so again, to come back a moment to the application parts of it, in a traditional architecture, because you're so constrained, you're constrained by the same origin policy. You're constrained by um, a variety of factors it was just easier to build everything on the server side and just push it out and, and then make incremental updates, maybe pull the server for incremental updates in your, in your web application. And, these, and that's why application servers became so big because they basically translated all of the stuff that the web application wanted to do for the poor little browser that was unable to do all the things that a desktop application could do. And so, what I'm talking about today is, is, is it also, it's not just a bunch of features, and, and sure, that's cool, and I can tell you a lot more about those features and the exact code snippets you might need to, to build things with it, but it's also a new kind of architecture altogether in which you do a lot more on the client side. And it doesn't mean everything, and it doesn't mean your business logic is gonna reside on the, on the client side now, but you have powerful graphics, you have local and offline, capabilities, you have device access, you have socket and other connectivity, 
And if you start taking advantage of a, just a few of those things, then you can build applications that are not just on par, but in a way even better than desktop applications. All right, I'm gonna come back to this uh, in a little bit. And I wanna start with the, the smallest of those four features that I talked about, and that is cross-document messaging. It's a simple API that allows you, it's called the post message API, that allows you to send messages. It's sort of an intra-browser communication API. You can use post message to send a message to, for example, content that is on an iframe on their same page. And you may know that a lot of the social, the third party social networking widgets that you pull on a page, Facebook like buttons and so on, they all use iframes. And it's actually quite hard to communicate to an iframe from the main page if that main page uh, or if that iframe content is coming from a different origin. An origin is defined as the scheme, host, and port combination. So with that, with that the browser locks things down it is the same origin policy, but that, that, that policy was, that's as old as the, the, it goes back to almost the very first browsers. It, we've sort of outgrown that, right? We need more connectivity to, to backends that are not on the same origin. We can't put everything on the same server. And so having this way to communicate to other, uh, other areas on the page, <coughs> Yet, at the same time, allowing to lock it down using origin-based security is this new feature. And you do that by using the post message API and then listening for messages. Now, the next feature I want to talk about is the XML HTTP request that you could say is the AJAX API. You can make AJAX requests that's been around for a long time. But in HTML5, it's updated. It's called XML HTTP request level two. And there are a couple of features. You can send binary data now. You can also track the progress better. But the most re revolutionary part of it is that you can now make cross-domain XML HTTP requests. And that's very powerful, because you can make backend connections to what previously had to be put behind an application, let's say some sort of portal server that aggregated all the content and sent it out with this from the same origin. Now you can actually say, all right, I make a backend connection for one source and another just by myself. Like, I don't need to go through that. And there's a separate standard uh, that's called cross-origin resource sharing that is applied, and it's basically a server protection feature where once you start opening it up, it's very powerful. But of course, the first question is like, well, how is that going to be secure? You may have used things like JSONP, which is very, uh, a very, it opens you up for a lot of vulnerabilities because you're basically running script from a remote source. That's the only way you could get around this in the past. And so now it is possible to do that in an elegant way. And there's a core specification. Effectively, that way, the way that it works is with uh, HTTP headers. Your browser that's capable uh, sends an origin header. The server has a list of, like a white list of allowed origins that it allows access to its services from. Server sent events is another API that is, um, think of it as a one-way stream of data. It's a formalization of what a lot of people uh, would call Comet, uh, sort of a server-side push. But now it's, an, it's called the event source API. You create an event source API object. You listen for messages. There are a few other things you can do. In about five lines of code, and I can show you that in, the, in our booth, you can create a, a client that very, that asynchronously listens for messages. And the only downside of this is that you can't, at the same time, talk back. For that, you would need WebSocket that we're gonna discuss in a little bit more detail. So it's, imagine you create a connection to a server sent event server, and you then start listening for messages. This is great for broadcast news feeds, taking maybe UDP backend data sources and pushing them out to the, to the web in a very standardized, way over HTTP. The next feature, and that, that's the one we'll take a little bit more time on, is, is WebSocket. And WebSocket is a new API defined by the W3C, but it's also a brand new protocol. That's really the, the powerful new thing. It's no longer using that, the, the restrictions, it doesn't, the restrictions of HTTP don't apply to it anymore. It 
really allows a browser now to open effectively a socket connection to a backend server. If you have a desktop application, you want to, to talk to a chat server, you don't first send that desktop Java client through an application server to then talk on your behalf to a chat server. You talk directly to it. You open a port and you connect. The same is now true for WebSocket. So finally, the browser is, it doesn't need that extra help from the application servers anymore. It can make a direct backend connection. And it can do that over ports 80 and 443, which are the default WebSocket ports. And that's actually quite powerful because the desktop application is often limited by whether those ports are open. In many corporate environments, that's not so easy to, to get done. And 80 and 443, uh, you can usually go out because those are the default web ports. Now, there are many benefits. Um, the first thing is, what, what would you use this for? You use this for any sort of real-time application, but also for anything that needs a bi-directional connection. So a great use case for that would be things like messaging in the browser or chat, right? A chat is a, the sort of classic example where we might both be talking at the same time, but with HTTP, you're really locked down because it's what is a half duplex protocol. You can't talk in both directions at the same time. It's almost like talking over a walkie-talkie, right? You, you hold the button down, you can talk, and then you release to listen. With WebSocket, that's completely gone. It's a single bi-directional socket connection. So you can imagine the kinds of applications that could use that. Uh, there are too many to mention here. First benefit is a huge reduction in unnecessary network traffic. You're talking about the order of 500 to 1,000 to 1 in some cases. With the, the, the Comet architecture, which is the, the, the one in blue here, you have constant polling of the server. You're constantly making HTTP requests and, and the server responds. That has an enormous amount of overhead. And you can trim that down, but you can't get it down to yeah, to, to very much below, let's say, 500 bytes per, per request. The other great thing is you have a huge reduction in uh, latency. And this was a study that was done by the, the Jetty application server guys, and it shows that the latency at scale is reduced by like an order of magnitude because on the left side is the, the um, latency measured in 100 millisecond bands. On the right side is the comparison with WebSocket and I urge you to take a look at this offline, but the bands there are one millisecond at a time. It's a huge reduction and, and right away able to go from 20,000 connections to, to 200,000 still with, with very, very low latency. So that's, that's a, I think especially when you start scaling up your application to, to web scale, then you're really going to need different techniques. And there are already, so all the browsers support it, but there are already a ton of WebSocket servers. And this, this I just recently said, okay, let's, let's make a list of all of them. And it, uh, it took a while, as you can see, there's a, just a, an enormous amount of stuff out there. And these are all anywhere from an experimental project to a production ready server. Uh, so you can see all the browsers support it. There's a ton of server support. It's really ready to use today. But we haven't talked about the most important benefit yet. And that's really extending WebSocket. The WebSocket is kind of like TCP. Okay, you have the communication pipe. Uh, what do you do with it? Now, on TCP, you would, you would very quickly write, uh, use some sort of protocol libraries. And the ability to layer higher level protocols is really the, the aim of WebSocket. So you can use, for example, an XMPP JavaScript library to speak XMPP or the Jabber or chat protocol. Similarly, you can use it to, to talk about uh, pub sub protocols like Stomp and AMQP. Also, the VNC protocol, which would be like the remote desktop protocol. Things like that are very easy to build on top of WebSocket. And once somebody has done it, other people can use it. And there's a ton of libraries already out there. Uh, a lot of open source stuff like XMPP client libraries and Stomp client library projects. It's kind of like, and later on you may go to some Canvas talks. You're probably, it's unlikely that you'll be using 
direct JavaScript calls for Canvas as well. You might do like move to and line to and stroke, then then you've drawn one little line, and that's not going to help you speed up the game development that you might be all about. So you would use physics engines. You would use additional things off the shelf to, to build your applications. That's what basically th this is about. Uh, you, you can layer higher level protocols on top of WebSocket and that's where the real power comes in. You can see it actually in the core protocol. There's already a way to add later on, it's not in any browser yet, but additional protocols that you can pretty much immediately ask to upgrade to. For example, chat would be an example of that, where browsers might natively speak XMPP or chat right away. <clears throat> okay. So. Demo of this is um, right here. So extending WebSocket uh, to speak a messaging protocol. I um, give a little demo here. So, insert the quick ritual dance to the demo gods here. <laughs> and, all right, so this is my iPhone. I'm actually controlling the slides. This is um, a little project that Peter Moskowitz from Kazing put together, where I'm not sure if you're familiar with Prezi. That's a Flash-based presentation tool. Somebody else said, well, we can do that in HTML5. They created Impress.js. And then Peter created what we call Presso, which is an extension to that where you can control it using WebSockets. So if you go to that URL, you can view it. Did you, were you able to see it? So you can, you can view it and uh, I can control it and basically swipe my finger across it and Peter's viewing it. So that's the viewer. I'm actually, this entire presentation was done using HTML5, Impress.js, Presso, using WebSocket. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> for good effects, right. And <clears throat> I'm basically controlling that with my iPhone. So using WebSocket with a higher level protocol, in this case it's like this stomp, it's a publish and subscribe protocol. I'm actually not just using raw WebSocket, I'm actually using a higher level library. It says connect to a message broker that, that you know, has all the, uh, a specific topic that I can subscribe to and we can show you much more about the, the lower level details of this uh, and in our booth. But just a good example of the kinds of things you can do, uh, especially when you start getting device access. For example, I could also, on an iPhone, uh, easily grab the, uh, the device orientation coordinates. And we, we created a little app with that. The, um, the one we'll show you later is the, uh, the race card we have going in our booth, which is taking the device orientation coordinates and uh, transferring them. Okay. All right. One other quick demo I wanted to show you is um, this one here. This is an example of uh, HTML5 in action. You have uh, WebSocket data coming in on the bottom there at the 100 messages per second. That's something you could simply just not do with the comet or old techniques for that are based on HTTP. On the left here, you have a Canvas implementation. So these are two Canvas graphs uh, using the R graph library to, to plot the graph uh, for gold and silver prices. Then I have things like drag and drop that I can use and I can buy and sell. And then on the bottom here, there's like a server sent events client that gets news data uh, streaming into the page. So all of that possible courtesy of some of these new communication techniques. And then combining it again, with other HTML5 APIs is really where the power is, right? The, the connectivity features we talked about, they just give you sort of the, the raw data coming into your page in a, in a very standard and, and efficient way. But now you need to do something with it and that's where you can use these other APIs, the, the other um, HTML5 APIs. All right, so I think I'm already pretty close to running out of time. Let me just uh, quickly throw this in there. I, I'll take the questions offline, but um, for all of you, uh, if you're interested in the book, actually this coupon code that is here, and I'll tweet it out as well, is actually good for any A-Press ebook. Of course, you should buy this one, but um, it's actually good for any A-Press book this whole month. And um, a couple of additional resources, I will make the PowerPoint available in, um, at, on the DEF CON 5 website. 
And that's basically it. Thank you.